Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to attempt to give you a little overview about how antibodies look like um, in reality and what they do and how we in industry and also a lot of academic folks, we try to harness the power of these kind of like molecules for the good of, of us to develop therapeutics, to develop um, medication that helps us humans to lead a better life. All right. Okay. I hope everybody can hear me well. If not, please speak up. Okay, so I've attempted to kind of like put this into the big context. Like we all live on this world, right? Um, but we are not alone here. We share this world with so many different organisms. A lot of them are really big, like elephants and whales and whatnot. And then some of them are small, like crickets and bees and um, hummingbirds. But there are organisms that are even smaller. And those we usually call microorganisms. And we usually need microscopes to even see them. So they are so small that you can't see them with your eyes. Um, and some of these microscopic organisms also live in our body. Some of them are good for us, like the bacteria we have in our gut system. They help us digest food. Um, bacteria that do fermentation, they help us to make um, cheeses, yogurts. They help to raise bread. They can make... Um, beer and lots of other foods that we enjoy and then there are bacteria and microorganisms that help um, nature compost leaves and recycle nutrients and these are all kind of like what we usually could call the good kind of microorganisms but there's some of them that are not that good at least in our for us humans these are bacteria that can spoil your food and that can cause diseases um, nope. So our bodies have basically, they have developed uh, defense mechanisms against these kind of microorganisms that we really don't like to have in our body um, that can cause diseases and, and you know, um, sicknesses. And so our first line of descent is actually a me mechanical barrier. It's our skin right? So it keeps what's outside on the outside and what's in our inside on the inside. And interestingly enough, it's like when we, when we think about this barrier, we usually think about the skin you can see, but we actually have a lot more epithelial skin on the inside, right? Because your mouth, your gut system, um, where you breathe in air, this is also interactions that humans have with the outside and so these epithelial areas is actually a lot more in surface area than our skin so it's just an interesting um thing to think about you think you have a lot of skin but you have a lot of more of this epithelial skill inside your body than you have on the outside and so, and then after this first line of defense we have developed a second line of defense that's called the innate immune system. And then there's even a third line of defense that we call the adaptive immune system. So what are these things? Um, the immune system kind of like evolved around, let's say, oh, it's 700 million years ago when there were like most life was sponges and these kinds of like um, animals and, and organisms. And this is a system which is basically what you have in your body. It's always there. And if something manages to penetrate your skin, like you, you, you step out of the pool and you get a splinter in your foot and suddenly on the splinter, you know, it goes into your skin, it's suddenly on the inside of your body. And the splinter might have had some bacteria on it that shouldn't really go into your body. So this first line of defense of the immune system is the innate immune system immunity and there are things like macrophages these are specialized cells that can basically stop a bacteria and engulf it and eat it up and get rid of it this way around 450 million years ago um, we have developed some things called the adaptive immune system and it is adaptive because it's quite marvelous it can it has weapons that it can adjust and customize to the exact invader that enters your body. So it makes really specific weapons um, that are tailored to 
um, and bacteria or some outside intruder. And a lot of animals live quite well and quite healthy just with the innate immune system alone. But everybody who is a vertebrate, and that includes like fishes, reptiles, birds, and mammals, we have this adaptive immune system. And the major weapon of this adaptive immune system is called antibody, or we call them also the um, immune globulins. Here you see a B cell on the left side, and it basically has on its surface um, this a, a kind of antibody, which forms with some other protein structure on the surface, something that we call the BCR. It's the B cell receptor. And it basically floats around in your blood system until it finds something that should not be here. It's the little green blob here. When it binds to this, and it could be some bacterial cell wall or virus, it basically it becomes activated. And upon this activation, it differentiates into something called the plasmacide, which have on the top side here on the uh, right side. And that is basically an antibody producing factory. So it switches its whole its whole um, being into something that is kind of like, okay, I have an antibody on my surface that recognized something in my body that shouldn't be here. I am not going to make sure I produce a lot of it. I'm going to secrete it to the outside into the bloodstream so that these molecules can float around and bind to the invader that may still be there. These B cells also can differentiate into something that we call a memory B cells. And these memory B cells are basically, they are like a record of what your body has seen. So at any given point of time, your body has lots of different memory B cells floating around in your body. Yeah, for each of them, there are only a few, so they are not that many, but they basically, they patrol your body and in case they see an invader again and you might have seen this invader previously they can switch and induce an immune res response and the production of antibodies really really quickly and that's kind of like we call this a secondary response and when you get for instance a vaccination you start with figuring out who in your body has an antibody in on the surface of the B cell that can bind to it and it has to differentiate and become a plasma cell and become a memory cell. This takes a little bit of time but when you get a vaccination you have all the time in the world because you are not actually getting sick from the vaccination. If a couple of months later you suddenly encounter let's say the flu, if you got a flu vaccine, you already have this memory B cell here and you can quickly switch on your body's response to quickly secrete antibodies and this will basically prevent you from getting sick in the first first place so it's a very powerful defense mechanism and these antibodies are very powerful weapons and oops here i wanted to point out you know we are often showing these blobs and say and tell you okay this is a cell I wanted to put in a picture of a B cell, how it looks like in reality. So here you see the B cell on top. And it has lots of things on the surface. And some of them are the B cell receptor and some other receptors that the cell needs as well. Okay, so there are different types of immune globulin in your body. Um, we have like little abbreviations for them. We call them IgG. So IgG stands for immune globulin. And the letter afterwards is um, basically an isotypes. And I think and I think the isotypes were just given to them in the order of how they were discovered or how they ran on the gel. So it does not really have um, a real meaning to it. The IgG isotype, this is the one that really looks like a Y shape. It's most um, illustrations, it's pictured like a little Y. So this is your main antibody that's floating around in, in, your, in your system when you have a reaction. It can make up to 75% of all antibodies. And it's, it's the, the workhorse force of your immune system. There's also something that we call the IgD. It is something that 
it's I think only one to three percent. We are not really sure yet um, what it really does. There are some speculations, um, but I'm not going to go into this. And there is something to call the IgE antibody. This is an antibody that is involved in allergy. Um, and when people are allergic against pollen or maybe peanuts or sesame, um, this is an antibody that's floating in your system and reacts to this antigen. There are two subtypes, two isotypes of antibodies that um, form multimers. So basically they assemble into higher order structures. One is the IgA. It can be a monomer. It's mostly a dimer, uh, but it can also assemble into a trimer. And this is an um, antibody that's mostly expressed in mucosal tissues. And the dimeric form has the purpose that it's less susceptible to being broken up by proteases that you have in, for instance, your saliva or in your gut system. Another antibody that can assemble into higher order structures is the so-called IgM antibody. It is also um, found in epithelial um, environments, and its main function is actually to help, um, uh, it's the first line of help when uh, like parasites or something like this um, invade the body. So basically, you will have the antibodies floating around in your body, uh, mostly in the bloodstream, circulating um, trying to fight off an invader, and IgA is mostly located in your gut, um, in your gut system. Okay, so we always kind of like the, the basic model of the antibody, we say it's kind of like a Y shape. And here's a little bit more of an explanation of how this is actually looking. So most antibodies have the same basic structure look like a Y, but they are not actually quite as simple as just a Y. So they exist of two different chains. One we call the heavy chain that's here in this kind of like whitish um, color. And the other chain we call the light chain, which is in blue color here. And two of these heavy chains and two of these light chains, they assemble into the basic structure of an antibody. On top is something that we call the fab, domain, and in the bottom, this we call the FC domain. The FC domain name comes from that very early on, people were able to crystallize this part of the antibodies, and so called it the um, fragment that is crystallizable, so FC. And the top portion of it is the variable portion. So it's kind of like has two domains, and on the very top, this is where the um, antigen binding area of the antibody is. So each of these antibodies can basically bind two antigens, one on its left arm and one on the right side here. And the fabs, and especially the variable region of the fab, that, that area is very variable. So the, the human body has basically different genes that it can assemble. Um, it increases the um, variety of this protein by having different genes that it puts together to make up the other body. And then it has a process called somatic hypermutation that um, adds on additional mutations into these areas here. And people have found that there are three regions that we call CDR1, 2, and 3. And um, I think it stands for classes of diversity regions, um, where they found that when you compare one antibody to the other, these regions are widely different. So they're different amino acids in these regions. And this is the power of this specialized weapon. So they can change the amino acid compositions of this area here and then make it bind to different antigens. Okay, so here is kind of like, there's a very simplified view of the antibody, but how does it actually look like when you look at the structure of it? So I'm gonna go to the structures here. And let me see, okay. So here you have a surface representation of one of these antibodies. You can see here labeled the antigen binding site. 
which is here on this side, as well on the other side, in the fabs of the molecule, you have a flexible hinge here. So these things are actually not quite as static as it kind of like a, a visualization like that makes you believe. These arms can move a little bit in respect to this FC region at the bottom. The FC region at the bottom can bind to cells via FC receptors, and that's also um, giving the antibody special functions in the immune system. And the top portion basically can bind to an antigen that's floating around in your body. So this is a surfing representation of the antibody. I'm going to now flip over to something that has the chains colored. So here you can see the different protein chains. You can see kind of like the red chain is one heavy chain. The violet chain, this is the second heavy chain. And then you see two light chains here in green and in blue. And on the tips here, it can bind to the antigen and on this other end here too. Here the four chains are um, colored in different colors, but in the normal antibodies, like these sides here and this side here would be identical. Um, protein engineers have figured out a way where you can actually assemble a molecule that has different antigen binding site here and then different antigen binding site there. And we can use this to make actually drugs and therapeutics. So now I'm switching over to a ribbon um, visual of an antibody. And um, the ribbon is nothing like else but a representation of the amino acid chain. So it starts at the top. Like if you follow the yellow one, the N-terminus is here at the top. It assembles into the IG domains. There are two at the top and two in the bottom. And the C-terminus of the monocle is at the bottom here in the FCs. And the other heavy chain here is in green and the light chains are in red and in blue. And on top here, you kind of like see that there are certain um, loops and structures that are protrud protruding outside. And on these loops and structures, there will be the CDR regions that are highly variable and make each antibody very specific to a certain antigen. Okay. So previously I've told you that there are antibodies, isotypes that can form higher um, structures. So here it's it's white on white, apologies for this, but um, what you can see here is actually an IgA molecule. And on top you see kind of like you can make out the Y-shaped structures on top and now on the bottom and their ends, the pseudomonal ends come together. And then these guys have an additional chain that connects the FC parts together so they can form a dimer. And the structure that is kind of like this, this big blob here in the middle basically helps the body, the antibody to be inert and not getting cleaved up by proteases that are floating out around when you um, when your body secretes this in, into your you know, gut system and in your saliva. So they can look a lot a lot more complicated than just the simple Y shed. The molecule that's the most complicated is the IgM that I talked about before. So that molecule, and I'm going to switch over to that one, is plays basically a role in host path pathogen defense. And it is made up of a asymmetric pentamer. So it will take a second to load here because it's actually a quite big structure. There are five Y-shaped molecules put together, and then there are additional change, chains that this structure needs so it can be held together. Um, here, each of the chains is in a different um, color, uh, but you can sort of make out the Y shape of each of them as they come together, making this pentamere. And then here on this side is, is this protrusion, and this is called the secretary component. So when this gets secreted, um, it basically, it gets this component added and it um, helps the structure also of from being uh, to be resistant against the proteases that you have in saliva and mucosal tissues. And in the middle, it also has something called the J-chain, and that basically holds all five Y-shaped molecules together. So you can see this is a really large molecule, it looks very complicated, 
but really has a big role in um, pathogen defense of our body. Okay, so this is basically what your body does by itself. It helps you defend yourself against things. So biologists and chemists and smart scientists, they have figured out a way to use these molecules and their amazing ability to become very highly specific for a certain target. And they're using this ability to manipulate your own body's immune system and your own body's cells to have, um, to have a benefit for folks that um, may have a disease. And we have found a way to actually make these kinds of molecules in the laboratory. And these are most companies nowadays make fully human antibodies. So they are really indistinguishable, indistinguishable from what your body will make. And we can search for antibodies that have specific characteristics. So you can, for instance, search um, for antibodies that are agonists. What is an agonist? An agonist is something that activates something, something else. So here you have an antibody and I have shown it here with this kind of like yellow receptors on the target cell. If it binds this receptor, it induces signaling. So it acts as a ligand that induces signaling. Um, and some diseases, people have underactive signaling pathways. And by increasing the signaling of the pathways, people um, people can, can get cured, okay? The other way is one searches for something called an antagonist. So an antagonist is something that blocks an interaction. So there's several kinds of antagonists. One is a ligand antagonist. So it means that um, it binds to a ligand and it prevents it from binding to its native receptor. And therefore, it prevents the signaling that it would usually induce. The other option is to bind to the receptor and shield the binding site from being seen by the ligand. So the ligand, again, cannot bind, cannot induce signaling. And then there are things that we call signaling blockers. They're kind of like, they block the signaling also by uh, preventing a core receptor, maybe, from binding to its receptor. And because those two can't come together, signaling doesn't start into the cell. Another form um, of antibody uh, that we can use is something that can bind a target and it can deliver something to the cells. Um, these we often call antibody drug conjugates. You can um, conjugate a toxin or a steroid or even radiation to an antibody. And the antibody will specifically go to only the receptor that it recognizes and deliver its payload. And you can imagine that, for instance, if you have a cancer cell and you have a very specific receptor that is expressed on this cancer cell, you could deliver a toxin to the cell. This um, antibody and the toxin gets, gets um, internalized into the cell and in the cell, it specifically kills only the cancer cell. So it's almost like a microscopic surgery that you do. Instead of having to cut out the whole tumor, you can really like precision kill only the, the tumor cells, which is, which is obviously amazing. And then antibodies can also induce cytotoxicity. There is something that we call complement-dependent cytotoxicity. Um, or uh, antibody-dependent cell-mediated toxicity. So when an effector cell then starts to kill the target cell, and we can mark target cells, like again, cancer cells, for instance, and they get killed. And then we can also bring together cells that may have problems binding each other in a disease setting. So here, for instance, I've, I've put on a T cell that can kill tumor cells. Um, and you bring them together, you help the T cell find its targets, and it can do its its natural job and kill, for instance, a tumor or cancer cell. So there are really cool things you can do with these antibodies. Um, and I also wanted to show you one example for a kind of like a blocking antibody. And let's go to the next one. So here, 
you will see a signaling complex. And the signaling complex is basically the R4R receptor pathway. You see here basically two receptors. One is in yellow, that is the R4R receptor. One is in red, I think that's the L13 receptor. And in blue, you see L4. So L4 is a cytokine that's kind of like it's a signal molecule. It's, um, it floats around, it's, it's being um, excreted and made by cells as a signaling molecule. And it basically binds to alpha-R and then to alpha-13 alpha on the other side and induces signaling. And the pathway this complex is inducing mediates um, something we call airway hypersensitivity and mucus secretion. And in diseases like, um, like allergy or asthma, these pathways are overstimulated. So we would actually like to have an antibody that disrupts the signaling complex so that the, the ligand here cannot induce signaling into the cell and all downstream effects. Okay, so there's actually an antibody that um, is now a, a medication, like a drug, it's called Dupixent. And what this antibody does, it binds to alpha-R, and then this loads. I can just show you exactly where it binds, because people have solved the structure of it. Okay, so in blue, you see now the alpha-R receptor. So this is basically what before was shown in yellow. And the big structure here in orange and green, this is the fab domain, so only the top portion of um, the antibody of a molecule called dupilumab. And the, the, the medication you can buy is actually called dupixin. And what you can see here is, when you remember these kind of like the, the, the structure that we've seen before of these two receptors and this blue ligand in the middle, it binds almost exactly around the area where the ligand would bind, like the cytokine would bind to this receptor. So now the antibody is bound here and the ligand cannot bind anymore. And what happens is the cell stays silent. The signaling pathway is not being induced. And so you disrupt a signaling cascade that can lead to asthma and uh, allergic diseases and um, atopic dermatitis and things like this. And if you are a person that has these things and nothing else has helped, trying an antibody like this to disrupt the signaling cascade might help alleviate your sim symptoms. Okay, and this is just one example of how you can use antibodies um, to to um, get your own immune system and your own body's signaling cascade to work in your favor and actually cure diseases. And people have figured out lots of different ways, as I said before, to do that. There are many antibodies that are on the market that are used for cancer treatments. There are many antibodies used in the immunological space and um, many more uh, different uh, molecules on the market. And there's also a lot of research going on. Many companies are working on this because these antibodies are so powerful. They can be so specific. Like this molecule you see here will not bind to anything else. It will very specifically bind to only this receptor and nothing else. And that can make an antibody very safe to take. And you can only need very small doses of it. Okay, I hope I hope I was able to show you some some things that you find interesting and give you a little bit of insight of how these molecules work. It's all it can be all very complicated and there's lots of details behind it. Um, so maybe you you know look up some additional things in textbooks. There are many good textbooks out there, but it gives a little bit of uh, a flavor of how this stuff looks like and how it can work for you. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Nepechnik, and a uh, virtual applause for you. Thank you. Um, this is fantastic. Um, so um, we'd love to uh, answer some of your questions. So now's a great time for that. And I'm looking, you can put them in the chat if you'd like 
as well. Opening the chat here too. Okay, so we have a possible question and it is an mRNA question. Is it okay if we have that question? All questions are okay. I will <laughs> try my best to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Nefetchny, can you see that question in the chat? <clears throat> okay, so I'm just gonna read it. Um... The question is about mRNA vaccines and why there is so much excitement um, when these mRNA vaccines are only making proteins. And the question is, is it just as effective and maybe more efficient to make the same proteins in a vaccine, in a vet with yeast or something, or is it easier to deliver mRNA into the body than it's to deliver proteins? Okay. <sighs> Okay, um, so it's a very good question. Um, so we are excited about mRNA vaccines because I think mRNAs inherently are easier to make than proteins are, right? So in order to make an extra protein, you do need to have um, specific cell lines that make it under very controlled environments. Um, and then you have to purify it. Um, proteins are sometimes very sensitive to temperatures. So often proteins need to be stored at four degrees Celsius. And, you know, proteases love pro um, proteins, so they can actually cut them apart. So everything needs to be sterile. Mm -hmm. With an mRNA, you basically, it's like giving somebody the recipe to make a meal. Like if, that, if the protein is the meal, then the mRNA is the recipe how to create the meal. And then instead of us humans reading the recipe and making the meal, you give the recipe to the body and you say like, well, you're doing this all the time because your body does transcription, um, translations all the time. It knows how to do it. It works flawlessly most of the time. So you just give, just give them the recipe and they can make that. So you basically, you circumvent all the complicated engineering that we humans have to do to express and purify the protein. I think this is the main advantage here. Um, and everybody is very exciting because the timelines to do all of this engineering to get proteins, it takes actually quite a bit of time to do that, right? And an mRNA can be, in theory, um, um, made and made into a vaccine much quicker. And I think that that is the main advantage. And I said, I think you said in there to make in the same protein in yeast or something. Yeah, for instance, yeast or E. coli, you usually don't use these types of expression systems because they are not quite as, as similar to hu the human expression system. So a protein that you would um, get from from a yeast or from a coli would have different decorations on the outside. They have different post-translational modifications. And you want to be as identical as possible to what your body has um, in order to not cause any side effects. Okay, you have a, another question. Um, do you have antibodies for pollen if you're not allergic to pollen? You have antibodies for pollen if you're not allergic to pollen. The short answer is no, you shouldn't. So in allergy, the, the main culprit that causes allergy is actually an antibody called an IgE antibody. Okay, that's specific to the pollen. You might have an IgG antibody that recognizes the pollen and clears it out, but um, you this doesn't cause you any troubles. Yeah, um, And so this IgE reaction to the pollen is something that is giving you the disease symptom and is abnormal. So there are actually antibody strategies where we create antibodies against um, um, an allergen 
like for instance, um, people have worked on the cat allergen, for instance, and you could give this to folks and it would basically decorate the pollen in your body with this, this IgG molecule so that your own body's IgE, the one that causes you the problem, cannot bind anymore. And with this, people can see alleviation of symptoms. So it's, it's a yes and a no. You have some antibodies and then pollen, but not the antibodies that that give you the um, allergic reactions, like the inflammation of the airways and the uh, stuffy nose and things like this. I hope Thank this answers your question. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I have a much more basic question. How do antihistamines like Zyrtec or Claritin work? <laughs> How do they work? Yeah, so they, they work on the um, effect of the allergy. So the, the block, um, so histamine is something that's um, being um, kind of like secreted by, by mast cells. And they are things that make you, you know, inflamed and all, all the typical allergy symptoms that you have. And if you block the signaling molecules, the histamines with an antihistamine, they kind of like they cannot um, create all these all these um, unpleasant side effects. So you you kind of like they work well, but they basically do not block the the source of the issue. They they block the reaction of the body. Mm. Okay, now I know. Um, well, thank you. Um, I realize it is forty-five minutes after the hour. Let's give a virtual. One more virtual thank you to Dr. Nefetchnik. Um, here you go. And thank you all for tuning in. And we will make uh, this recording as well as a 3D interactive version of this available to all of you. And have a great afternoon. All right, thank you. Happy Sunday. Bye-bye. <laughs>